Tom Brown's school days, the author Thomas Hughes, who spent his childhood in Uffington, in the Vale of the White Horse, writes, if you love English scenery and have a few hours to spare, you can't do better the next time you pass the White Horse Hill and stop at the Farringdon Road or Shrivenham Station and make your way to that highest point. And those who care for the vague old stories that haunt countrysides all about England will not, if they're wise, be content with only a few hours' stay. While glorious as the view is, the neighbourhood is yet more interesting for its relics of bygone times. I only know two English neighbourhoods thoroughly, and in each, within a circle of five miles, there is enough of interest and beauty to last any reasonable man his life. In the days of Tom Brown, the journey to London was long and hazardous. Today, courtesy of British Rail, it takes about an hour. Uh, and this, together with the M4 and other major roads, has given tourism to the Vale of the White Horse with all its associated benefits and problems. But in January, although the weather may not be comfortable, the valley is as quiet and remote and as private as a place can be with warm pubs separated by bracing walks. And although the first month of the year is supposedly the dead month, there's still plenty to see and to be fascinated by. top of the downs runs the Icknield Way, the oldest road in England, which, as the Ridgeway, runs from the Wash through to Salisbury Plain. Fascinating to think that our ancestors were walking this track way before Britain became separated from the continent by the Channel. Each year, the Uffington White Horse is said to walk a mile along the Ridgeway to have himself shod at Wayland Smithy, a mysterious prehistoric burial site. It was Sir Walter Scott who wrote that you can tie your horse to one of the ancient stones, whistle three times, put your money down, and go for a ten-minute walk. When you return, the money will be gone, but your horse will be shod. The local racing stables seem unwilling to test the truth of the legend, but the people of the Vale, conscious of the air of ancient and romantic mystery, often use it as a trysting place. They believe that if they have no success at Wayland Smithy in the moonlight, they may as well admit defeat. January nights are bleak and blustery in the Vale. But they're much improved by good pubs, like the Pound at Goosey. What a good girl. <laughs> the winter nights are also cheered up by a local dancing group called the Corn Dollies, whose routines are based on traditional dances which originated down the road in Wantage. There's a chap called Alfred Williams went cycling around collecting songs and writing about the way people danced, uh, the way people lived generally. And he reported Morris dancing north of the Thames and step dancing south of the Thames. He said that the men of Berkshire and 
Wiltshire, of course we're in Berkshire, we're not really Oxfordshire, we don't admit to that, load of rubbish. Um, the men of Berkshire didn't like dancing with their ankies and their sticks, they preferred to fight with their yeah. sticks. And so the dancing in this area was mostly step dancing. Yeah. Some of us are married to men who don't dance, and then some of us are married to men who do Morris dancing. You see, we like dancing, but the Morris dancers dance with each other. And they don't dance with us very much, you see. So we've got to dance with each other, you see. That's all there is left. Traditional arts and crafts in the Vale of the White Horse are being kept alive by Frida Rudman, who teaches the children at Stamford in the Vale Primary School how the Victorians spent their time creatively. My grandmother, she bought me my very first tatting shuttle, and I was so interested in learning how to tat, and it took me three months to learn how to do it properly. And uh, after that, I started looking for antique tatting shuttles to see if I could find the old tools that people used to use long ago, which are so much nicer than the modern day. Actually, you've got a pretty flag. And also, when you're doing like a presenter, if you twist the wire one more time, it'll be a little tighter. And then I started a collection and then went on to other crafts from that, looking oh. for the old tools and the books to show me how to, how to use them. You twist them you want to twist them more into a flower shape. A man called Corporal Jean de Laporte made the very first straw picture, and it was a Peterborough Cathedral and it took him three years to make his picture and a member of the clergy bought it for the priceless sum of three guineas. Mango, like that. Mm. So Each county has its own particular corn dolly and there's usually a story to go with every one. I prefer making um, like the little Norfolk bell. Um, a camp, there's a lovely Cambridgeshire bell which came from the bell ringers going ahead of the procession uh, to bring the harvest home. What's your aim with them? I mean, obviously, the old crafts were in their pattern. Are you changing them? To revive them? some of the old crafts that are dying out and you don't read about so much and you don't see examples of the work. And also, financially, a lot of the tools that were used long ago, the paper and the pins and the, the glues, they're quite cheap. It's an easy source of material to use in school. Lord Wantage was given an estate without a folly by Queen Victoria in gratitude for his war services. The workers lived in the estate villages of Ardington and Lockinge and were employed on a unique profit-sharing basis. Ardington had a farm which bred horses to work on the estate. Today, the buildings are used by various talented craftsmen. In what used to be the farm dairy, Les Owen has his pottery. moment was the dairy and the mill next door and the granaries and so on and all of these buildings were to serve the estate. Being built as a dairy keeps a, a nice cool atmosphere, slightly damp, which is ideal for clay work. It's not so good for us in the winter time of course. <laughs> Well, it's a place to live. It's a very pleasant spot. Um, we've got all the downs and lovely walks. Not that we get much chance to go out and walk because we're here all most of the time. Although at first sight it seemed to be a little bit off the beaten track and tucked away, when you think about it, we're surrounded by towns such as Oxford, Reading, Swindon, Newbury, all within a nice tight radius around us, and that brings a lot of people to us. So as a place to work, it's very good. Basically, it's still much the same as it was. The Chinese and the Koreans were, were firing to very high temperatures way back, you know, when we were still running around almost in, in skins, as it were. The clay is, you know, it's still a natural product which is dug out of the earth, so that hasn't changed. It's different, and people can come down, and if they like the style of the pottery, then they will buy. It's also much stronger because we fire up to very high temperatures. It's stoneware, which means it's much more durable. It's going to last a lot longer than the, the stuff that you buy in the shops. The market 
town of Farringdon was the home in the 30s of Lord Berners, the composer and painter. Robert Heber Percy, a friend of Lord Berners, is the present owner of Farringdon House. He keeps colourfully alive one of Lord Berners' charming eccentricities. Lord Berners was a very cultivated man and he got melancholia because of the war. And he had a lot of exotic birds that lived on grapes and bananas. Which of course weren't available. They weren't available and they died. And he got depression. And when I came back on leave, I thought what I could do to cheer him up. And so I thought of going to the chemist and getting some dramatized and, and dying. He did cheer him up. He liked it very much. On my 21st birthday, and that was a long time ago. So there's a lot of opposition from an admiral, <laughs> and he said he could see it from his window if he looked through a, a spyglass. And they asked him, does he look through a spyglass often? He said, every day. And you've enjoyed it ever since? I've disenjoyed it. <laughs> why, why disenjoyed it? It was my 21st birthday and I ordered a horse. <laughs> Not a tower. This is racing country. The White Horse Downs boast some of the finest turf in the world, and the aristocrats of the horse world stretch their legs up here every morning of the year. the boss at Eastmonton Stables at Sparsholt. Then make your way up to Moss Hill. Make sure to keep one behind the other with that. Where I've always worked with horses. I came here five years ago to start training. Can so we make sure they all keep in behind one another, will you please? It's a lovely part of the country, lovely people, and of course it reminds you a lot of home. She's a good gal. They canter every day, but twice a week um, we have galloping days. If you don't train them, they can't run. There's a lot of downland around here, which of course is very good for training resources on. There's chalk underneath and it drains very quickly, so you, you usually have pretty good ground. There's men that look after the gallops and they have to look after them very well. Mark, 
Martin Ewan Brom down to the very end, one behind the other, coming out of the dip, drop to one another and finish up nicely. And how do you spot the winner? Um, I think they usually tell you themselves, actually. You get horses and they're, they're doing nice work and then they improve and they improve and you don't have to ask them to tell you themselves by just looking at them. There's a lot of enjoyment in it and, you know, I love my horses. It's, it's great. It's a lovely place to be. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else. <laughs> 